What is the best crypto portfolio to put together for this year? We're going to be going over all of the major sectors in crypto. Layer 1s, Layer 2s, DeFi, real world assets, gaming, and a few others. How investable are these? And are there opportunities here? I've gone over all of the major institutions research, Binance, Coinbase, many others to put together this video. Each and every sector will be listed as a timestamp down in the description. At the end of this video, I'll be going over some portfolio construction as well, because if you want to allocate to these sectors, it's actually really simple. You just choose a percentage of your portfolio and then go into it with you know a few names that you want. So we'll go over how to do that and some things that I'm gonna be doing in 24 and five as well. Hopefully we have a strong market, which gives us many opportunities to make money. We don't have to be desperate with this. We can just be professional about it and make some money. So in January, 2024, I'll be updating my crypto investor course. All of this type of research comes for crypto course members, you know, before YouTube, right? So the price will be going up during uh, January. But what I'm going to do in January when the price goes up and I update the course with all of my latest research, I'll be putting a discount code in this video specifically down in the description. So you'll get the old price because I'm making this at the end of December, beginning of January. So for this video, if you're watching it, if there's a discount code below, that means the price has gone up, but I will put a discount code below in this video to get started uh, for you guys. And we're gonna start with gaming first. Gaming is probably one of the sectors that has a lot of interest in it. Many people are into gaming, they realize and understand the opportunity here. Gaming itself is a huge industry. And so any tie up with cryptocurrency is obviously very exciting. So let's see what's happening in crypto gaming right now. Also some of the opportunities, but I think some of the things that we have to be aware of that are still major roadblocks, because there are some major roadblocks here, right, in terms of the amount of revenue that can come in, because that's really what we're looking at, right? Gaming and crypto, you can see, wait, in-game items as NFTs. Okay, we can, we can understand that that's an opportunity. There may be some trading volumes around that, which creates revenue for these tokens. There's many opportunities here uh, that people are excited about. Now, what I'm really reticent about with gaming is how does a token investment make me an investment return? Because there's two different things that we're looking at here with gaming, right? The first one is we're investing in a token that may have value in some way because there's demand for it. So you're looking at like an NFT within a game, right? So in-game items that someone either discovered or created, and if they create them, you know, maybe they actually create the NFT themselves and sell it. So that's, that's a job for them. That's not really an investment. Now, of course, we can trade in-game items, which can create revenue for ourselves personally as well. But again, that's not really investing. That is working and doing work to create revenue for yourself. So again, that's an opportunity. But what I'm really looking for is what is a token that can have value because it's earning fee revenue, right? And so that's what I want to invest in. So let's have a look at that. So here's the revenue from a Binance research report. All of the reports I talk about in this video will be listed below. A lot of other links to, uh, you know, the bits of data and some of the dashboards. I'll link it all below down in the description. So what we can see here is video game market revenue in 22, 3, 4, and 5. So obviously, uh, 4 and 5 is expected, tiny. In terms of blockchain game market revenue versus the entire video game market revenue. Now again, with gaming, you have game developers that create games and they need to make money from those games. And so how do they do that? Well, they can create a blockchain that charges a fee for every transaction and so the blockchain itself earns a fee that goes back to the token of the blockchain and that token accrues fee revenue. Okay, so when that token accrues fee revenue, they can return that fee revenue to investors in a couple of ways. The first one is by paying staking rewards. And the second one is by burning that token and so reducing the supply and then lifting the market cap of the tokens or the price of the remaining tokens. Now this is essentially like investing in the network uh, that earns fees, right? So I'm not gonna call it a business because a network and a token, it's, they're actually not businesses and it's not investing in the equity of a business. But to be totally honest, 
I would rather just invest in a business and say, your business is earning money from this game and I want a share of the profits. That's not what we're doing when we're buying gaming tokens. And that's my major thing that I'm like, how is this token specifically going to earn a load of money and return that to me? Right, so that's that's what we're looking at. By the way, up in the top right hand corner of each of these, I've just got a kind of weighting of, you know, is it a risky investment or not? Or not, right? Yellow and red means I think it's more risky in terms of volatile. There's gonna be a lot of stuff that does well, but a lot of stuff that doesn't. And during a bull market, some things may go up, but may not. So revenue seems to be increasing well, but obviously still very low. So potential opportunity here. So let's have a look at this how these games are developing over time, right? In terms of what is the benefit of an on-chain game versus just having a game, right? Because everyone plays games and they're fine with it. You have a Steam account or whatever, you know, other accounts, and you link up your, your payment method with your card, you buy the game and that's fine. So what is the specific thing about crypto gaming that is actually going to change things and actually move over a lot of the gaming industry? So traditional games, you can see off-chain game server, Assets and gameplay subject to the rules of the developer. You go to hybrid and fully on-chain games where you're looking at, you know, game server and logic are actually on-chain. Now, this is obviously still very expensive. And so as blockchains get cheaper, then people can move over. But for right now, I think you're gonna be looking at really, really simple games, right? The type of simple games that people play on their mobile or something where you can just press a button over and over, right? On-chain, like real, like, you know, AAA games, it's gonna be a lot more difficult for them to move over. Suitable for certain types of games though, that is changing with technological advancements. So you can see there are games doing this right now, but they're, they're very, very early on. They don't have many, if any users. And so really, you know, we can speculate on these tokens all we want, and that's a game within itself. Speculating on tokens is probably the biggest game of crypto. But when you're looking at, you know, games that have a lot of users, what I would really want is to invest in a token of a game developer that has many, many different games that they have, and the revenue from those games in some way is streaming down to this token. Because if you're looking at in-game tokens that are used as money and things like that, I think that's almost impossible to have long-term value, right? Because money within a game then it's not really money because the money is centralized through the game. And so what you're really looking, what I would prefer is that, you know, Bitcoin is money and people use it in these games or Ethereum use it in these games. But what these games are tending to do now is use their own token as money. And that for me just is a red flag because what they're trying to do is just pump up the price of this thing, right? Because their business model is, as long as the price is higher of this token, we can sell it for loads of money. And in the end, it doesn't matter if the game does well because we've made our millions. As an investor, you're just wanting to invest in a game studio or developer that has loads of games as a properly run business and somehow earns revenue from that, right? So there are benefits to fully on-chain games is that you have in-chain, you have on-chain assets that can maybe kind of proliferate um, amongst different sorts of games, right? So if they're if they're using the same uh, smart contracts or the same tokens on the same blockchains then I think the real opportunity potentially is to have these protocols underlying that you can actually use these different assets across across different games. Now, again, that sounds really cool, but how is, re how is revenue from that going to a token? Because I need to invest in something. I'm not gonna speculate on these in-game tokens because that just seems ridiculous and it doesn't seem investable to me, right? So here are some engines or some game engines that are being developed. And you can see the year they've developed basically the last few years. So we're at stage one and I can't really see any games that are actually, you know, revenue producing large or anything, right? So this is incredibly speculative in terms of any of these tokens. How do they actually have a value long-term? But you can see 2022-3 when these game, engine, game engines were developed. And I wanna have a look at this, right? EVM, EVM, EVM. EVM, StockNet is Ethereum ecosystem eventually. So we'll just say Ethereum there. So for me, you know, getting exposure to crypto and some gaming, Ethereum just stands out, right? Because that's an actual profit uh, producing, revenue producing asset that I can hold. It has big 
mainstream value. It has, you know, it's the thing, it's liquid, the thing that people want to buy. So EVM stands out. So throughout this video, what you'll probably hear me say a lot is just buy the layer one because it's actually an investable asset and everything else for me personally is way, way too risky and speculative. But of course, everyone can have their moon bags in their portfolio if they want. Now, Pima Engine, you can see they're actually on a couple of others as well, Cardano. Cardano has a, a bunch of games that are actually doing pretty decently. Uh, the uh, UTXO model on Cardano is actually pretty good for some of that stuff. But anyway, they're building on a bunch of different chains, but it's really just EVM, as you can see, Ethereum for now. Um, now, as you can see here, languages are an issue. I think within this Binance report right here, if you want to scroll down, and I will link this one because I've, I've read through this, one of the issues that they go, th what they say is that, you know, the EVM or the um, Solidity language isn't really great for gaming. And so what may happen is a separation of the blockchain-based languages and then just building kind of separate games on their own separate chains that can send assets back to some public blockchain for them to have value. Because what I really see as the value potentially here is in-game items having value, user-generated content within games that can be traded and have value there. And so if there is a way to generate rev revenue from that, that's interesting. But again, is Ethereum just the play here because it's the thing that actually generates revenue from all of these smart contracts and everything that, everything like that. Uh, so as you can see, open source here. And these are the engines. So the gaming industry with crypto is like absolutely tiny. But as we're getting cheaper fees, right? So you're seeing Polygon here with their ZK technology um, reducing reducing fees down to like 0 0.0001 cent per transaction. That is going to make a lot of game developers come over because there's a differentiation here for having assets that people can actually trade. So what are the major types of games that are actually successful now? This is data from a CoinGecko report right here. So we'll go through a couple of these. So the main one right here is farming and mining which is by far away the leader. Now I have a problem with this is that farming and mining is essentially these game developers kind of trying to get interest in a game by basically paying you money. So the way it works is that you have a game developer and they will say, come and play our game and you can mine and farm tokens for free within the game. And obviously they're creating these tokens out of thin air and you know maybe they have a market for them and they try and get the price a bit higher to make these tokens worth something. But essentially what these gamers are doing is saying, if we play this game, we can farm these tokens and make some money and then just sell them. Now, of course, that is not a reliable long-term business model. The way it's working right now, because we're so early in crypto gaming and you know there's just not a lot of demand, right? The, the supply is easy enough, that gets worked out, but it's actually finding real demand that is the, the difficult thing. And what's happening right now with farming and mining games, also with move to earn games as well, what they're doing is creating a token for free and saying, come and use our stuff and we'll give you these tokens for free. And then people either, you know, buy them, or mostly they just get the tokens and then sell them for actual dollars, like stable coins, right? So this is a very classic business model, a venture capital type business model. And Uber did this same thing as well, right? So for the first few years when Uber started, they were very cheap and they wanted to get market share. So what they did is went out into the public markets, they sold a lot of equity in their company and they raised a ton of money. Now they used that money to... Uh, essentially give you fares that were unaffordable. So they would pay the drivers and they would give you cheap fares and they would make a loss every time you took a ride. And the way they paid for that is going out into the open market, selling their equity and getting loads of cash. Once they had a huge market share, they then turned the screw and Uber is now way more expensive than before because their company wants to make a profit. So that's what's happening right now with mining, farming, move to earn, and basically a ton of these applications, right? Is that now what they're doing is instead of having to go to the market and say, we've got a good idea, give us money for out for equity within our within our company, what they're doing now is just creating tokens out of thin air, 
right? And so they've kind of skipped the process of having to raise equity in their companies and actually have an idea that may work. Now they're saying it doesn't even matter if our game works. It doesn't even matter if our app works because we've literally created these tokens out of thin air and we're trying to make the price higher and we're giving them out to people. And you know, we, didn't even, we didn't even sell any equity in our company for this, right? So that's the problem I have with farming, mining, move to earn is that these you know may just collapse because the business model you know doesn't exist right now when you take the token incentives away why do people want to pay for this stuff right M most of web 2 is advertising based and so if you're asking people to pay for transactions or things you know once the token incentives go away do you actually have any reliable business right so those two not great for me um, and of course, as token incentives go away, they may move down. Now, card games right here makes a ton of sense to me. This is like perfect for crypto because you have potentially all of these cards or other characters as NFTs. What do people do with card games? They play the card game, they collect the cards, they trade the cards. That makes unbelievable sense for crypto because now you have you know these cards that you can earn, trade, swap, and you know that you own them. And you can maybe swap them um, anywhere else on any exchange. That makes a load of sense to me and a massive use case for crypto, I believe. The other ones you can see, unfortunately, we're just nowhere near having more complex games integ integrate uh, crypto. It's just too expensive. It's too slow. Uh, the size and scale isn't there for right now. So that's where we are. When we're looking at uh, GameFi addresses, I'll put some details below where you can look at the top games as well and the you know unique active wallets or the weekly active users. You can see all of that data. So that will be in the gaming section down below. Alien Worlds, Farmers World, Sweat Economy. Again, these two, you know, when they take token incentives away, is anyone going to use it, right? Remember like move to earn and stuff like that. You're paying people these tokens to walk around and then the tokens are gone and literally no one uses it, right? I think the move to earn um, on Solana, you know, during a bull market, people get excited and they're getting paid these tokens that are going up in value. You get people come during a bear market, everyone disappears, token goes down like 90% and you're, you're stuck in this thing. So that's why for me, I put red here, and the game tokens themselves, you know, they are so risky because they don't really have any revenue model to sustain the value of them over time. Now, it also makes it extremely volatile in bull markets as well because you have the potential to go viral where you have people that are earning tokens to bring on new people and you have this earning thing. Sounds a little bit like a multi-level marketing scheme, right? Which is bad, like a Ponzi. It's like, hey, come and use this app. I'll earn some fees and this, and it goes up and up and up, and then bang, it goes down. That is unfortunately the model of a lot of these, which is why I mostly stay clear of this type of token. It's just too risky for me. And I'll go and buy ETH or the layer one, right? So it's up to the individual, but just to have a look at this. Then you're looking at GameFi addresses and transactions. So addresses and transactions on, on these blockchains. And as you can see, what is happening, if I get myself out of the way, you can see that we have some uh, chains that are specifically gaming centered. And that makes a lot of sense to me because you cannot have, uh, you know, these uh, kind of general purpose blockchains like Ethereum and Solana and Binance Smart Chain having a ton of games on there, clogging up transactions for, you know, DeFi and stuff like that. So yeah, it makes a lot of sense to me. If you have three layers of risk, you have layer one coins, where the most important smart contracts and financial transactions happen. They have some exposure to everything in crypto. Then you have the next layer up, which is kind of like on the layer two, which is like Immutable X and Wax, which is like, we're kind of a uh, an ecosystem where we're putting money into games. We're launching those games. They all happen on this kind of blockchain ecosystem. It's not really a blockchain as such. It's just kind of like a, a network right? A bunch of networks that they have on these layer twos. And hopefully all of that kind of gaming that happens does flow down eventually into some fee revenue for those tokens. So again, this really needs to be, you know, kind of the layer one type thing, which is like, that's a kind of big store of value asset. This is more an investment kind of in a gaming network, which kind of makes sense as well. So you're going up in the risk there. And then obviously you just have in-game tokens and in-game in-game items, which are just like 
super risky. You know, they're going to pump and dump for sure during bull and bear markets. And, you know, maybe that's more for speculation. You know, maybe you can trade them if, if you're very specifically good at that. Um, but for, you know, investors, usually they're probably going to go towards here. But you can see you have specific chains that do have more exposure to gaming if that's what you want to do. Now we come to some of the potential downsides and issues for games. The major issue I see here for game coins is that, well, firstly, they don't really earn anything right now, right? There's no revenue model. There's there's virtually no gamers. So if you're investing in something, it's like, well, I just hope that I hope that this game goes well and maybe gets a bit viral during a bull market. And so that gaming token goes up. The other side of things is that, of course, like I just said, the Uber model is that a lot of these games are issuing tokens simply to give out to people for free. Uh, right to play the game and so if you want to play those games and farm those tokens that's one thing you can do but if you're investing in this like it's an investment just know that the game itself is literally just pumping these tokens out into the market and giving them away for free so why would you buy something that's being given away for free and of course these tokens if the game doesn't go off are going to be worth zero whereas if you go down the risk you know, the risk curve a little bit, you're looking at blockchains that can potentially just earn some fees from games that do eventually go viral, right? So that's an issue. So I'm going to go through this as well, which is a, is a recent launch pad on uh, Binance. I think some of the backers of Ace, this token, come from Tencent, which is one of the biggest game uh, developers in the world, and huge revenues from games, so they know what they're doing. Um, again, I don't want to promote any of these tokens or say they're good or bad or anything. I'm not going to do that in this video. I just want to talk about sectors to uh, give some overview of the risks here. Cost issues of games is major. No one wants to pay. And so the costs of a game, the blockchain transactions have to be taken away from the end user. That has to be free for them and has to be paid by the game developer. Distribution issues because none of these games are in the big distribution platforms. That is a major issue. App stores as well don't really like them. Third, for, third party platform issues and trust. You need mainstream adoption to actually get a game to have value. And these third party platforms just don't really like them. And, and there's just an issue here with games and hacks and everything else and regulatory issues. Because what you're doing, right, what you're actually doing is creating games with some tokens inside. And are they money or, you know, in America, there's very heavy securities regulations. And so you could be stepping into like uncharted ter territory, which can really make an issue. That's why these in-game tokens are so uh, kind of very, very um, unfortunate in the way that they come about because they don't want to break any of these securities regulations. And so they have to make these tokens have value in some way. But the link is incredibly spurious about how they kind of earn and sustain some value over time. So a lot of the way that they use these in-game tokens, you can see in-game spending and earning. So you buy this ACE token, right? just speci specifically for ACE, but a lot of games have this. You buy the game for spending or earning, you use to buy for in-game items and tickets and things within the game. So that they're saying that as long as the game is popular, there will be demand for this token because they need to use it within the game to buy stuff. You get very close to basically having this as a money. And that's an issue because it is not money. This will never ever be currency because there's only one currency in each country, which is the, um, you know, the legal tender of that country, which you can spend, you can earn and spend without any tax liabilities. These tokens may end up as having tax liabilities within the countries. So you've got a gamer, right, who, who, you know, it doesn't know this and is spending and receiving coins and suddenly they have this tax liability at the end of the year and they're like, what on earth? So that's what I'm talking about regulatory issues, is right? It's like, if th this is not money, but it's being used in game as money and that is a major, major regulatory issue and that is a major downside of these tokens. It's like, these can be zeroed overnight, by the government saying any in-game tokens used as money is essentially has a tax liability on it. The other thing that it's used for is staking and governance. So again, it's a little bit like buying the equity of a, a company, right? Because when you buy equity, you have the 
you know, governance rights. You can go and vote at an AGM. But again, this is not a company. It's like a blockchain. So again, it doesn't really make sense as to what are you going to do here? You're going to vote for stuff and you have like five coins and you, you know, like voting is just ridiculous anyway because there's like three or four people that started the game that actually have all the tokens. And so voting is a bit of irrelevant, right? And staking, yeah, again, you're paying people a reward to stake, but most of that's coming from inflation because the game doesn't make any money. And so that's actually an investment as well. Like if the game did blow up and actually made very good revenues and paid people like income from that, well, that again is an investment. And if you invest and get rewards, you have to pay tax on the profits that you make. But you're also spending that thing in game as well. And so the actual you know, underlying for this is a total mess in the States, in the UK, in Europe as well. Like what a headache. You buy this coin, you spent it, you've earned some money. It's a tax headache and it's an investment nightmare. But they're using it for all of this stuff. And so that's why I personally feel these game tokens are completely uninvestable for me. Um, but again, gaming is a major, major industry. It will get bigger. And so for me personally, layer ones that just have some exposure to that or even layer twos is where I would want to be. But that's my thoughts on crypto gaming. The most popular crypto narrative in 2023 for CoinGecko, unbelievably, is artificial intelligence. This is something that uh, I believe is not investable within crypto, to be totally honest. And the reason for that is because what we can see is that AI requires a massive amount of investment and the Silicon Valley companies have already made their moves. Google is working on this. They've got all of the data. You can see Anthropic, which is potentially being invested in by Amazon. And you have OpenAI, very heavy links with Microsoft. And this is a huge growth business. And I don't personally see a lot of link up right now between crypto and AI. I think it's a buzzword. I think it is being used to essentially pump tokens and sell something that just isn't really a business for right now. Um, so crypto AI, I think, is somewhere where I don't want to invest at all. I understand that during bull markets, narratives, you know, pump, but I don't want to be I don't want to be in that. Right. I'm just going to invest through the bull market. I understand how a bull market works and the macro cycle moves prices and risk taking. I'm very comfortable there. But in terms of specific projects with AI, these things are incredibly speculative and, to be honest, reek of penny stock pump and dumps. This is my opinion. There may be some, some decent projects in here, but if we look on CoinGecko, this is the AI sector. What we can see here is that, you know, there's a couple of projects right here. Now, Render, I would put more into DPIN or DCOMP, which I'll talk about later rather than AI. Um, but what we can see here is that, you know, there's a couple of market caps that are over a billion dollars. But if you look at the 24 hour traded volume, some really big red flags here. The first one is a billion dollar market cap asset trading five million dollars in 24 hour volume is extremely uh, alarming. This potentially shows that this asset is, well, firstly, $5 million is a tiny amount of volume for something that apparently has a billion dollar market cap. That's worrying. That shows me that there's no real price discovery here. Now, of course, these things can pump hugely in bull markets. And if you just want a moon bag for this stuff, that's fine. But I see no real business use case here. And of course, most of crypto doesn't. And so we're all trading on speculation. I get that. Um, but I'm just much more comfortable in other things, right? So AI, as you can see, it really falls down the list in terms of market cap. And you're getting some, some projects here that, you know, essentially what they're trying to do is try and link up a market for, you know, AI or a market for some sort of compute, you know, through a blockchain. And I just don't really see the link up there. I think how it works is that a company has a product and the market works by paying the money for it or not, if it's good or not. And so just having an AI blockchain, it doesn't make any logical sense to me. Um, and so I really don't want to be anywhere near AI. And so that's that's my opinions on AI um, for now, this bull market. I'm absolutely going to stay clear of it personally. Also in the top three of this report were meme coins or that side of the industry. So I'm going to talk about this because 
you know, whilst I'm not going to invest in any meme coins, I, I, it's the same thing again. It's speculation in a bull market. You have things that go viral or basically you have people gambling, trying to get other people to gamble. Price can go up and you can either make your wins or your losses there. I think we all know that meme coins are simply a game at the casino, right, overall. And eventually they're going to run out of, you know, of steam because eventually there is no community here. Maybe they can be integrated into stuff, but there's no real investment use case. It's just, yeah, I'll have a moon bag of that and that's fine, right? But what is happening through all of this, this kind of industry here is it is ultimately benefiting the layer one coins. Any activity that happens on a layer one is going to benefit the layer one coin. And so NFTs are going to happen or, you know, meme coins, or whatever, they're going to happen. But eventually what happens, you know, is that these real assets come on and, that, and that's the real use case that we're going for. So personally, right, we can see here that NFTs and things, we know that these are products sold to customers. NFTs are a product sold to a customer. That's not an investment. I cannot invest in that. I can trade those products if I'm incredibly adept at that, but they are not an investment and I'm not going to invest in them, <laughs> right? So what we need to see here is, is there an actual way we can monetize this in a sustainable fashion? And which blockchains are going to do that? So what's some notes here? UGC, user generated content can go extremely viral. Why these networks can have value is because the same as social networks, it is an av it, it, it's, a, it's a singular thing that can have an exploding use case. So Facebook doesn't, right, Facebook doesn't create content, YouTube doesn't create content. They're the biggest content providers in the world because they're a platform for everyone to make their own content. Can we do that with blockchain as well? Can we have user-generated content, right? So NFTs, in-game items, creation of something that you sell, right? Maybe uh, you, you're selling your work. So someone in another country is making, uh, editing videos or whatever, and they're just using blockchains to get payment and to have, um, you know, selling their products and stuff like that. That makes sense to me. That's a long-term revenue generating use case. UGC is really important. If there's going to be a blockchain that has an application that goes viral and people use it and generate their content, that can really get big. So that, that's definitely a use case. What I want to look at more is who's providing the tools for the economy to thrive. These are digital economies at the end of the day, and you need tools so that you can explode to a billion users who are actually generating revenue and GDP for that economy. I think it ultimately benefits the underlying currency of that blockchain. That's where I'm comfortable. Meme coins are simply just a roulette table. So what we can look at here, this is Bitcoin ordinals. Uh, that allow inscriptions. So different to NFTs, which have typically been a contract on Ethereum or other smart contract chains, and then the NFT vi visually, like the JPEG, is stored off chain on a different server on like IFPS. So you don't actually own that JPEG, you own the contract of the NFT launch. Inscriptions actually etch uh, you know, a data into a block. And so it is physically there in that block forever. Now that's pretty cool because that has, can have a lot of use cases, right? If a app could be made that simply allows anyone with a wallet to create user gen generated content and inscribe it onto a blockchain, that could potentially be something that is, you know, something very beneficial for maybe that app and the blockchain that it's on. So what blockchains would I want to be investing in for that? I want to be in the chains that I know are going to be around for the next 100 years, right? Because if people inscribe stuff on some weird chain that isn't popular, it's not going to be very valuable. So again, value for me is important. Ordinals and inscriptions are blowing up. So again, it's a speculation use case. I don't want to be in that end of stuff. But I think generally... If you have a blockchain like Bitcoin, and a lot of Bitcoin maxis are extremely up in arms about this and they hate it, 
Bitcoin is an open public network. There's going to be a ton of stuff on this network that you don't like, right? The internet itself has lots of content that is illegal or generally unpleasant, right? But it exists. And no one says the internet should be shut down. With Bitcoin, you're looking at this thing potentially being that big, right? It's money for the world. It's going to have a ton of stuff on there that people just like, I don't like that. But that's fine, right? Because that's just, it, it's a mirror to humanity. It's a blockchain where people can inscribe stuff. In any case, this is a use case. Maybe it will die out. We don't know. But it's good for the underlying chain that human beings are, are seeing this and wanting to experiment. And the first stuff's going to be a joke. But over time, people can say, hey, there's going to be a spark. Now, I think the most reliable chains, Bitcoin and Ethereum, are going to be the most desirable to put things on because people know they're going to be there forever. So Ordinals is an exploding use case. I don't know if it's going to be uh, exploding and you know getting larger. It seems like there will be some reason to inscribe things. Many important documents are being inscribed on the blockchain right now, uh, including some things that would otherwise you know be kind of blocked from the internet or stuff. So this has a use case. Don't worry about the JPEGs and the memes. This is important and this is why Bitcoin is here. So this is pumping off. You can see that. Um, this is just inscriptions as well. So you can see all of this data. I'll leave the June Anal Analytics dashboard uh, down in the description so you can have a look at this yourself. But you can see things are happening. A use case for Bitcoin, fees generating. A blockchain has to be sustainable. Fees have to be paid so that either stakers or miners get that reward. And is it is a sustainable blockchain over the long term. So... Um, I think this is good in general. Now you can see everyone's getting in on the act. So you have KuCoin here, nothing against KuCoin or the KCC chain. But again, they're, they're doing inscriptions on their chains as well. So again, you may have chains that have you know, low fees because people think, yeah, it's just, a it's, you know, it's not, it's not Bitcoin, right? It's not going to st stick around for a long time. But, you know, you have other chains that, you know, have their, their products on there and they may be, um, you know, fairly good for them. But the major valuable use case for me is the top chains, right? It's Bitcoin and Ethereum to actually inscribe stuff. But Bitcoin, certainly, because it is that, you know, it's the number one chain. You know it's going to be around forever. And so inscribing things on it may be actually pretty valuable. Talking about user-generated content as well, this is a new project from Binance. Now, again, I don't want to promote this project. I'm not, I don't work with any projects ever or want to promote the tokens at all. But again, I just want to look at the sectors to invest in here or, you know, things that are happening on blockchains, right? So I think this is happening on BNB chain. This is user generated content. So an application that lets anyone create an NFT and have that on the chain. And you can also use some AI tools to create this content, right? So if you want to create, um, you know, some picture that's you see in all of the you know, the, the kind of user generated AI content is extremely good, right? So how do we get that onto a blockchain? Once you have it on a blockchain, you can actually sell it. Now, this is different, right? Because you have AI from these companies, which is fair enough. And so they're, they're big companies with big investment and they have the data and they have the AI uh, language models that actually create this stuff. That's cool. But as an individual, which is where you get this huge scale is, can there be applications that let individuals use the AI to create the content they want and then sell it? Now, you can't do that without crypto. It's incredibly difficult because you're going to create the content and then you don't have the you, right, you don't have the NFT of it. And so if you put it online, you immediately lose ownership of it because people just copy paste it if they want. Right. I know you have copyright and there's there's massive um, issues here with copyright as well and everything like that. But as you can see, a tool that lets anyone create stuff with AI, then have it as an NFT to sell and earn, you know, crypto dollars instantly for that, either the layer one coin or a stable coin. That is allowing the, the crypto economy to grow and flourish. And that's why I think it's important. Again, you don't have to buy the apps. You can buy the layer one coin, which may be an, a better investment overall. It's just the thing that you know, underlies that economy. Another huge part of the industry is DeFi, very big and there's a lot of different use cases here. So I'll split this up within kind of DeFi and then real world assets, which are obviously, you know, a narrative that uh, is growing steam and is actually, you know, actually growing users. This is the part of the industry that I'm much more comfortable with being, you know, a, you know, a qualified investor and having worked in the industry. So, you know, I understand this a lot more and it makes total sense to me. 
Uh, now, what you're going to have here is protocols that uh, essentially let people trade, right? So trade tokens or lend out tokens. Pretty much it. You have trading, you have lending, uh, and then you have some other things like you have perpetuals trading or futures or derivatives trading. So that's a, a big area as well. Uh, and then you have bringing real world assets on chain like uh, treasuries. Now, one of the biggest markets in the world is uh, is uh, you know the US treasury market or other types of national debt, you know, like euros, uh, pounds, every country will have their own debt and issue their own debt. That's traded a lot. And so obviously bringing that on chain is going to potentially reduce fees, make things more transparent, have a lot more data. It's a massive use case. It makes total sense to me. Is it investable though, generally? Because there's a difference between the layer one coin, and I'll look at Ethereum here, because most DeFi is on Ethereum. You have Ethereum, which could potentially be this massive, worldwide, um, credibly neutral asset. I won't call it money as such, but it's a huge, worldwide, decentralized, non-government asset. It's very, very unique. Versus a DeFi protocol, which is basically a business right? Yes, there's lots of differences here, but it's basically a business where you have a group of developers who develop the, the protocol, try and make it a little bit better, make sure that people are using that protocol. So the token investment of a DeFi project is an investment within that protocol making fees. That's fine. That, that That's great. If they make fees, then the price will go up, right, of the token. However, Will that outperform just holding the layer one coin? Because as of right now, it hasn't. And so DeFi is great. And the biggest use case in the world for crypto is just being like this huge financial ecosystem, right? Finance itself underlies everything else. Let's have a look at some data here and how DeFi tokens themselves haven't really outperformed just buying the layer one coin. So this can thrive outside of the USA for right now, in my opinion. Um, now, a lot of issue outside of the US is that most countries or most companies need dollars because most debt is issued in dollars. And so there's a massive demand for dollars from people and countries and companies outside of the US. Dollars that are outside of the US banking system are known as Euro dollars. It just means foreign dollars, non-US dollars. And there is a massive Euro dollar system in place around the world for these dollars, for these dollar denominated liabilities that were created by non-US banks. It gets a little bit complex, but basically you have a country or a company that wants to raise debt. And so they do that but the people you know, buying that debt say, you need to pay us back in dollars because you own the money printer in your country and you could just print millions of, of your currency to pay us back, debasing the currency. Actually, that's what the US is doing right now, but we won't get into that. So DeFi outside of the US makes massive sense because you have a blockchain accessible worldwide, you have Euro dollars, which are stable coins like USDT, USDC, and you have the ability to trade and lend them with instant settlement and you don't have to worry about the bank saying sorry we're bust now or the or the government of a country saying yeah we're just going to print billions of of these you know yo-yo coins to pay you back definitely can thrive inside the us it's basically banned it's banned until 2024 until the election and things may change until then DeFi is absolutely banned within the states maybe ethereum and bitcoin get an etf but DeFi, no way and, and the regulation here is going to be insane as well because it's coming. They want to regulate everything. They've regulated the banks, so there's no growth in the banks. They're going to regulate this very, very heavily because they're so afraid of losing control of the money supply and the trade and settlement of dollars wherever they are in the world. That's the downsides of DeFi. It's just getting, you know, getting crushed and crushed and crushed in the States where most of the capital markets are. These are actually pretty profitable businesses because it's just charging a fee. Like when you trade on Uniswap, you pay 30 basis points as a fee. And um, you know, the profit the uh, protocol can be extremely profitable because it's just software. They do underperform the layer one coin, which we'll get onto in a second. So let's have a look at some data. This is, I think, Uniswap right here. Um, and it's, a, it's, it's an extremely 
profitable chain. Now, Uniswap, the token, doesn't accrue any fees. So it's basically worthless. It's worth about $5 billion in the market, but it doesn't accrue any fees. Now, the reason why it's worth money is because people are buying it now in anticipation that in the future, it may pay some fees back to the token, but it doesn't now. And so, you know, it's just like, oh, do I really want to put money into that? I used to have a Uniswap, I don't anymore. Um, so as we can see here, you just have all of these um, trading pairs of different tokens, most of them up against Euro dollars or stable coins, USDC, USDT, Bitcoin, Ethereum. These are big assets that people want to trade and they trade them and they pay a fee. It's not, it's not more complex than that, right? And so if you're the biggest exchange by volume, then you're going to be pretty profitable as a business. Now, Aave, as you can see here, I believe some of the profits that Aave makes does come back to the token, um, but you have to check that specifically. Aave is the biggest lending protocol, so you have an asset like uh, Ethereum, you can take a loan against it and you put the Ethereum on the uh, application as collateral. If Ethereum falls in value, then they'll just take your Ethereum and sell it for dollars to pay back the person that gave you the dollar loan. Um, so, you know, very effective. For right now, Aave is over collateralized lending. Um, so if you want to buy, if you want to borrow $10,000, you need $12,000 of ETH to borrow that, uh, you know, $10,000. So they have, um, you know, an amount of um, money there that they can liquidate in the event that prices crash. Total unique users, 20,000. It's not a lot, right? Very, very, very small, but it's valued at a few billion dollars, fully diluted, which is a pretty big market cap. This is actually a very, very profitable protocol, especially during bull markets. That's great, but again, there's just a lot of downsides. Is it going to be regulated out of existence? Um, you know, also, when the market gets big enough, the big players are going to come in, right? BlackRock have said that tokenization is the future. They are clearly making moves in this space, right? And so when the market gets big enough to actually mean something and be pretty profitable, the big players are going to come in and crush all of these names. Now, Ethereum, Bitcoin, these big networks are like public and necessary, but a DeFi app, it could get crushed if BlackRock come in. And so that's one of the issues. I think there's always going to be this split between what I would say like onshore versus offshore. So onshore, BlackRock, Fidelity, you know, Vanek, all of these guys developing onshore stuff, which is like TradFi regulated. And then there's going to be offshore, which is like Aave and the other bits of DeFi, which are always going to be slightly you know, to the edges and, you know, for kind of non-US. And so, you know, obviously the internet isn't on or offshore, but the users and the and the, the liquidity and the money flowing through is going to be kind of regulated versus kind of semi-regulated and kind of we don't really know what's happening, right? So I think the big use case, maybe just BlackRock and Fidelity coming in here and saying, we've got all the volume, we're using Ethereum to do this stuff, but that's it. So that's why I think DeFi apps, again, are risky. So you have RWA, real world assets. Um, these DeFi projects are small businesses. And again, nine out of 10 fail, or if the business go, goes very well, they're gonna get crushed by the big players. Real world assets, meaning dollars and other fiat currencies issued on chain. Also, treasuries and other government debt issued on chain. You've seen a lot of uh, corporate debt issues on chain as well. So green bonds and things like that. So a company ne needs to raise money. They issue bonds to investors on the blockchain. So you own the bond, you send the stable coin to the company who uses that and you get the bond in your account. So again, I see a big difference here between onshore versus offshore. There's gonna be some issues that just happen directly on chain, but the most, the, the biggest amount of volume I think is going to be essentially using uh, some public blockchains, but a lot of just what they call private blockchains, which is basically just private databases run by the banks, right? Because really, you know, maybe it goes on chain, maybe maybe they do like a layer two on Ethereum, maybe, but they don't really need to, right? If you're in Goldman Sachs or anything, you're, you're a client that wants to invest. Goldman Sachs has the company. They can just link you two up directly and they, they don't really need to use a public blockchain. So 
These are big. You can see the real world use case growing. These are uh, tokenized public securities. So a lot of this, what that means is like debt, right? You can see there's bonds. The asset type is bonds. A massive market potentially coming on chain. You've got T-bills here, mostly T-bills. T-bills are a massively liquid market. There's huge demand for them. If you can reduce transaction fees or you can make it easier for hedge funds to just buy and sell straight away, it makes a ton of sense. They get their dollars into these T-bills. They get the revenue straight into their account. It makes sense. You can see this up and to the right, all right? So tokenized issues are what, five, 600 billion, uh, million, sorry, tiny, absolutely tiny, but growing. So yes, it's a good industry. For me, you can see a lot of these individual apps right here. So you have Ondo here, you have Mountain, which is uh, essentially a stable coin that you can invest in and you get the yield because the stable coin is invested in T-bills, which pay a yield about three or 4% right now and uh, you get that three, four percent. So it's basically like investing in T-bills. So again, offshore versus onshore, this is available to anyone. So if you're just a normal person in a country that has no access to this, th this product, you now have access to it. And so that's obviously a benefit to proliferate the access to investing to more people. But in terms of the big you know, the big banks and things like that, I don't think they're all coming on chain and using some protocol. They're gonna do it themselves. A lot will be off chain. Some will flow on chain. So DeFi is massive. It is um, making it easier for individuals to earn interest on their dollars at the actual rate that's paid. So banks take your money, they buy T-bills, they get 4%, and in your checking account, they give you nothing. Well, with crypto, that's gonna end where if you have dollars, you'll be getting the the rate, the real rate at all times. So that's gonna be passed through to you, maybe with a small clip out of it, right? So yes, this is a massive, massive sector. A lot of these applications may stay small or become medium, which is fine. A lot of them are valued pretty highly right now in relation to what size they may get to. But again, the layer one coins like Ethereum, some of the other um, smart contract chains are going to benefit and we're you know in a big growth phase you can see that happening right here so this isn't going to stop because there is demand to earn yield on fiat currency that currently doesn't earn yield DeFi apps have tended to underperform the layer one coin this is uniswap versus eth so uniswap valued in eth down this is Aave valued in eth down this is pancake swap which is the biggest uh, exchange on the BNB chain, although it's multi-chain now, it's pretty much the second biggest exchange. This is PancakeSwap valued in BNB coin down, and this is Injective valued in dollars. I couldn't get it versus something else, but in Injective uh, is actually at an all-time high. Injective allows for cross-chain swaps between um, assets from different blockchains, which is doing pretty well. So it's a mixed bag. Overall, what you could say is if you just invested in ETH, you would have outperformed most of these DeFi investments. Now we're going to look at DPIN or decentralized physical infrastructure. This is happening on a bunch of different chains and it's something that crypto allows. There is a lot of risk here as always, um, but potential. So as we've just gone through DeFi, if you want to know how to use DeFi, how to use wallets, how to set yourself up with crypto, how to actually take advantage of you know, buying government debt with your dollars rather than, um, you know, nothing and having it in your checking account. The Crypto Investor Course has 300 videos going through everything in crypto, including getting yourself set up with wallets, how to use DeFi applications step by step. You can see all these videos here uh, and just how not to get rug pulled or wrecked with some of this stuff, right? So you can see DeFi here going through it. Um, wallets, how to use them. All my updates and research also come for free for existing users for all of time. We have a great community here where people ask questions and get answers. So again, link below. Um, I will have a discount code uh, in the description when I update the course, because whenever I update it, the price will go up, um, but I'll give you guys a discount code that takes it back to the original price, because I'm between 2023 and four right now. Anyway, details all down in the description. So DPIN, which is kind of new, um, and like Coinbase say here, some potential, but for right now, like most things in crypto, no real users, no real revenue. So you're taking a punt on something that may or may not work. What is DPIN? So what they're trying to do is use 
the benefits of crypto to essentially have payments between people and networks that are easy through stable coins and other tokens, low cost, where you can basically rent out something that you own to other people that want to use it. And of course you get payment through having a blockchain wallet in your account tied up to that network. And when they make payments for that thing, you get the percentage that's owed to you. And you, you, you can't really do this without crypto, right? What happens now is that you have a centralized authority and you know, like a business, right? So let's say like Google or whatever, and you know, money comes into Google, they pay you a percentage out, you know, but what, whatever it is, you know, cross border, it's, it's messy and it's slow and everything. So with crypto, they're trying to say, hey, if you want to rent out something that you have, um, you can do that and it's very low cost and it's instant. And so it, it does have some potential, but again, these businesses are high risk, small, 90, 90 plus percent failure rate. Sell the use of your own hardware, use a crypto network to receive payments. The problem I have here is that does the business model really work? I'll show you some examples here. Again, I don't want to advertise or promote any tokens to say that they're good or bad um, because I don't work with them and you know they're probably going to fail. That, that's the, that's the you know, reality of this. But what I want to know is does this really have a business model and demand past the first phase of kind of interest. So the, the way that capitalism works is that you have a group of people that specialize in doing something and they become so good at it and they use economies of scale to bring the price down so much whilst still making profit that that thing benefits other people. Those people that are specifically good at doing their thing earn revenue themselves and are willing to pay money to someone else because they're creating a product or a service that's so affordable because they're ultra specialized. Deepin basically scraps capitalism in the way that it works and says some ragtag bunch of people can, you know, stick something in their house and maybe someone will rent a little bit of it. So that's the, the downside for me is like, is this actually a real idea that actually makes sense and is going to be large scale? Because a lot of these tokens are valued so highly that they're the kind of wrong price. They're, they're kind of priced wrong for how risky they are. They should be like 90% cheaper than this. Now, maybe you want to go into bear markets. Deepin is very new. And so again, it could pop off during a bull market. If you're really interested in Deepin, it's still so new that just wait till the next bear market where everything's really low and maybe go in. So that's what I would say. After the token incentives run out, is there real demand? So let's have a look at uh, some things that are happening. So one uh, example of this is render. Very simply, distributed GPUs. So if someone needs to do something with a GPU and they need to rent, you know, compute, um, they can do so by using the render network, people have the GPUs and they can rent out use of them to people that want to buy and that goes through the render network. Kind of makes sense, I get it. For me, if you're a company that has a, a demand for GPUs or whatever, are you not just going to Amazon Web Services or one of those who are absolute experts in this? They have the best data centers in the world under, underneath mountains, they're cooled, they have great economies of scale, that works. Having this is, 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 an, is an issue, right? You can, it's just like, well, who's gonna, who's gonna rent out their GPO? Is it reliable? Can I reliably get the amount of compute that I want at all times? Because these ragtag bunch of people may not rent out, it may be very volatile in terms of how much compute that I can get. How does it work, right? So that's the issue that I have. Do you need a blockchain for this? Do you need a marketplace on a blockchain for this? Or do you just say, we need to rent some compute out, just go to Amazon Web Services or something else. So that, that's one of the issues that I have. Um, now, another use case for this is, again, I don't wanna promote any of these coins. Um, another use case of this is decentralized telecommu telecommunications networks. So this is happening on Solana, it's also happening on Cardano that I know of, 
where you're essentially saying, we've got some uh, telecommunications nodes, they have signal, and you can download an app and then pay for the signal from these nodes. That makes sense. Now, why don't these companies just buy the nodes themselves and put them up everywhere? Well, there's obviously a lot of issues around that. So what they're trying to do is say, you buy the node, you put it up outside, and if people use it and they're on the network, you get some money. So again, this is like, is this actually going to work at a large scale? Because of course, if you go into an area where there's no node, what happens? Well, the way that Helium do it is essentially you, you use their nodes when you can, and then if you can't use any nodes, then you just flip over to like T-Mobile or, or one of the other networks like AT&T. Because it's so small right now, and there's, you know, there isn't signal everywhere. So like, is this actually going to reach scale? And the answer is, I don't know, but it's probably unlikely. There's some information here about where they actually are. So very, very small scale right now. I think uh, Miami is the one that Helium Network is doing. You know, again, not a lot of hotspots to, to actually, you know, play around with. You can also see that this one here, so these are apparently hotspots for Helium. Um, if we look at the revenue that they generated, you can see in the past 30 days, you're looking at around 12,735 IOT. And so when you're looking at the price of that, um, you know, you're looking at a tiny amount, right? Like I think it's $30, $40 or something like that. So that's, that's the issue, right? Is that you get sold on this idea, like you're going to make money by buying this thing you just put on the side of your house and then no one really, buy it, no one really pays for it. You don't get any revenue. So yeah, I just think this is potentially something that could happen. But once more, if the business gets big enough, then you know potentially other bigger uh, you know companies get involved with this and try and make money off of it. But I just feel like scale is the thing that drives prices lower, not the ragtag bunch of individuals having these kind of sparse things around. So it's the business idea. I'm not sure the implementation works out. You can see Coinbase here as well saying, uh, moreover, DPIN projects have been focused on how to incentivize participants to supply the necessary hardware, but only a few have started to tackle the financialization models of driving demand. That's a nice way of saying none of these like things make any money and there's not enough demand for their business. Um, and they're just giving away tokens over and over and over again. And so, you know, eventually that has to stop, right? And so that's the issue. So I think D-PIN for me, red, it's a narrative that may do okay in terms of bull markets, lots of prices go up, narratives pop off. But I think, you know, if you're interested, maybe you can wait till the next bear market to see if something else maybe comes about. Um, but again, this is the experimentation that happens on the layer one coins, which are like a diversified bet on the things that do actually succeed. Now we're gonna to touch on layer twos and infrastructure within crypto. So what we're looking at is networks that are much more centralized and actively managed, but they are a part of the stack because you have the layer one chains, which are supposed to be large, distributed, probably expensive and slow because they focus on security the most. Uh, and then you have the infrastructure on top, which is providing easy products and services to vendors. So you've got Starbucks that are working with Polygon, right? They're not blockchain based. They don't, they don't care about that. What they want is, you know, a, a dashboard where they can make NFTs or, or do something. Maybe they want to accept crypto payments. And so they need an infrastructure provider there, right? Makes a lot of sense pretty decent long-term business. There's gonna be a few big winners um, as most industries. Again, if the, if the use case and money to be made gets large enough, what is stopping Amazon, Google, et cetera, uh, having some of this market as well, right? Saying these blockchain exists, right? So Ethereum exists, we can make layer twos, right? We, we can have these networks, we can do that. M maybe they do it. And so again, these businesses get crushed. But I think some of these businesses are big enough now where they're like, actually, um, you know, they've got a lot of the tech, they've got a lot of the kind of mind share. And so maybe these uh, businesses can do well. What I want to focus on here is that layer two coins and infrastructure, they are not money in any way, like a layer one coin, like, like uh, Bitcoin can be worldwide money. 
these things are not. And so the only way they have real value long term is by charging fees to customers, right, and earning some money. And so eventually they're just going to be valued on how many customers you have, what's your revenue run rate, right? What's your daily active users uh, and, you know, how much money you're making from that. Now, you can say that about layer ones as well. The only way they have value is if more people use them. I get that. But these things are way more business like. So they're going to be valued more on the revenue side rather than Bitcoin, which is like it's a store of value. And so it's, it's a different it's a different kind of valuation model. So infrastructure and layer two, they do have to provide some infrastructure and earn some fees. So they're not money. And that's why a lot of them, I would say, are overvalued in terms of from how much money they make now. They're valued very highly. But of course, the growth is coming. Um, so roll apps as a service. You can see this Binance report. I'll link this below. What is this? So you have layer twos on Ethereum trying to make it cheaper. Makes sense. This is where a lot of the applications will live. And so you have like a cloud service, Amazon Web Services, one of the best businesses in the world, massively profitable, makes Amazon huge. This is what these guys are doing on a smaller scale for Ethereum is saying, you want to develop on Ethereum, you can use our roll up. Optimism, you can see right here, has a stack, a network stack that is being used by Binance and Coinbase and I think Bybit. They're developing layer twos with this technology stack. Makes a lot of sense there. Um, Base is obviously Coinbase's layer two. You have a lot of different ones right here, you know, Starknet, um, Loopring. You know, a lot of these are developing these layer twos on Ethereum where people can use some of that technology and then use it to their advantage. So this is really like a B2B type thing where you have a network stack, you have the ability for these businesses to say, look, we want to get into crypto, we need a network, we need the ability to do something. We're using you because the layer one Ethereum, that's, you know, this massively uh, expensive, diversified kind of thing. You know, we just need the Amazon web services of crypto, right? So one thing is, these are pretty successful uh, networks right now. If things get bigger, I am sure that Amazon and others are going to come into the business. They're not going to come in until the business is so large that it actually makes sense for them because they're not going to come into a small business. But some of these networks, I think, are just going to have uh, a decent chunk of the business because they're crypto native, right? So you're looking at Arbitrum, Optimism, Polygon, you know, the Ethereum layer two stuff, right? Not actually that many businesses in this. Polygon, Optimism, Arbitrum. You can see all the data here. We'll have a look at this. Um, this is uh, rollups as a service. So we'll look at decentralized storage. Again, part of the infrastructure layer and things that need to happen. So Binance, uh, this report, which I'll link below, you know, they have a blockchain which is called Greenfield, which is essentially just for uh, data. So it's decentralized data storage, which is big. So you can have businesses that run off of this. So, you know, we know that Google Cloud, um, you know, other cloud services are hugely profitable, massive businesses. But of course, your data, if you use iCloud or any other cloud service, your data and all the stuff there is on their servers and is ultimately owned by them, right? If they detect something that they don't like, they have closed people's accounts before from things that they did that weren't wrong, but the the you know the system like closed their account uh, even though the person did, did nothing wrong, and they're like, all my data is gone. I can't get it back because I'm blocked from the account. They blocked me. So you have to go through this process of like this legal process, getting it back. With decentralized storage, you can use blockchains to store things as a cloud service that you have control of. So again, there may be things here with regulation. And also we know that decentralized identities are coming online, which is where, you know, you have to have an identity in your wallet that is linked to your exchange account first to make sure that you're not a criminal or anything before you can use these services. But a lot of this stuff with BNB Greenfield is more kind of backend stuff. So game companies or other things, they, they can put some uh, data in these blockchains. But because it's blockchain centric, very easy to link with other services and get payments between them. This is happening on Cardano as well. Something uh, launched, I think it was Iagon or something, which is essentially decentralized cloud storage, right? So you can have your account there and you don't need to use, you know, big tech, centralized tech. So we know cloud works. We know cloud storage is a big thing. And it's you know, more and more moving on online uh, to cloud storage. So this works. Maybe it's safer. 
uh, and you don't have to give your data to you know big tech. BNB Greenfield here, a decentralized data storage system. So this is within the BNB smart chain ecosystem. So again, infrastructure, you know, layer twos and infrastructure, these are not money. These are um, businesses and the chain itself has to make money, right? So it charges a fee and you would hope that the fee is uh, you know, enough to pay for the blockchain and to pay you some returns as well. So more investments, um, but again, for BNB, you know, they have a token that's across that whole entire ecosystem. So BNB Chain, OP BNB, ZK BNB, BNB Greenfield, many others. So it's a token that pays for infrastructure. Um, so it has some revenue model to it, right? Not money like Bitcoin. Bitcoin's just kind of just very, very different, right? So Ethereum scaled, Optimism here is scaling Ethereum. So what they do to make money is um, they take a thousand transactions, let's say, and they post it down to Ethereum as one transaction. It costs them... $50 to post to Ethereum, and they charge the users in total $100. Those users get a much cheaper fee environment because they're collective with others, and Optimism makes a, a profit between what they pay Ethereum and what they charge users. So again, this is not money, but it may make money from the transactions and the profits that it can get from those, right? We have Polygon, which is doing exactly the same thing. It's actually calling itself more like this Amazon Web Services thing, which is they are opening up Ethereum. So you want to develop on Ethereum, come and use Polygon because they have uh, all the different types of scaling layers and they make their profits you know, through uh, people staking the token, people paying fees for this infrastructure. So again, they're actually making money, very small right now in comparison to what they're valued at. Um, but over time, if we think this industry grows a lot, then obviously you're you're looking forward to that. So what we can see here is that this is blockchains via the revenue that they make or the fees that are paid. Don't like to say revenue a lot because they're not businesses as such, they're blockchains. And this fee revenue is designed to secure the chain so that people stake on the chain to secure the chain. Um, so you can see Ethereum over the last three, six, five days made 2.4 billion in fee revenue. You have Tron and Bitcoin here. And then if we look at layer twos, we're coming all the way down the list to Arbitrum, which is 60 million in fee revenue, ZK Sync, which is 60 million. You also have uh, Polygon down here at 36 million in fees. I think the use case is pretty simple. They are a part of the network stack that has businesses and other types of users that use them to make Ethereum cheaper and to just develop good products and services for them. They pay certain fees for that, um, and that comes in the token. That token accrues value from fees and revenue, and then it's paid out back to the individual investor via token burns or staking. So it's a it's a bit it's a crypto business basically through the kind of network model. It's not an investment in a company. You're investing in that network uh, and the profit it, profits it makes. But they are profitable. They're not anything like ETH but they are probably like second order in terms of, yes, they make money over time. The issue here is that I think a few winners will emerge because you're gonna to have to benefit from economies of scale here. And as, uh, as the fees that you charge get crushed by competition, you know the big players are gonna win out just by having more volume. We'll quickly touch on layer ones here as well, an even smaller number of tokens that are really investable. So, Bitcoin is what it is. We all know that it's extremely successful. There's an ETF coming in 2024, most probably. Um, it's a large liquid store of value asset um, and it has demand. Ethereum, different smart contracts. So allowing for other things, the issuance of other tokens and decentralized finance. Layer one, huge, large, massive worldwide store of value asset. Ethereum makes revenues as a, as a blockchain. Uh, as long as users are on this. Ethereum is by far and away the kind of most profitable largest chain. There are others though. Tron is very popular uh, with uh, stable coins outside of the US in a lot of emerging markets. Binance Smart Chain, as you can see here, is also very used in emerging markets. You've got about a million, uh, a million active users on there with Tron and, and Binance Smart Chain. And that's about it. Right, the others are, you have Solana here, which is doing pretty well this year. You can see that. Um, a lot of people are trying to push Solana into be the kind of third ecosystem, right? So you have Bitcoin and Ethereum, which are bedded in. And then, you know, everyone's looking like, what's the third system? Can there be a third operating system? 
These are more like decentralized operating systems with layer ones, Ethereum, you know, BNB chain, the Binance ecosystem, Solana. Um, they're trying to be even Cardano, right? Uh, which TVL is going up very well recently. These are trying to be decentralized operating systems as such, right? So the new, um, you know, financial operating systems where a lot of things happen. So that's really it. These are going to be valued quite highly as long as there are people producing revenue and GDP in these network states. It doesn't get more complex than that, I think. If you're just looking to invest in crypto, the layer ones are the place to start because everything else is like a business. These are different. These are investments in networks and really you're just looking at who's developing on them and are more people developing these things over time. You know, and you're seeing that happen, especially with Ethereum, uh, BNB Smart Chain, Bitcoin, they're, they're all growing very well. So we all know that that really is crypto, is that those layer one chains. I do separate Bitcoin from everything else. I just think it's wildly different. Bitcoin is not really an operating system. Ethereum is because you have smart contracts. BNB, Solana, Cardano, they have smart contracts. They're trying to be operating systems with businesses on top. Bitcoin is just different because it is simply send this from this wallet to that wallet. And then you have the mining network, which is you know supposed to keep, keep this absolutely strong and never ever changing the uh, amount of coins there. It's a different beast, Bitcoin. A lot of people may be Bitcoin only, I get it, but there's a lot of opportunity in other layer ones. You know, the big ecosystems can change over time. I think Ethereum has shown itself to be kind of the, the leader here and the development activity and what's happening here, most of that is on ETH and the scaling of ETH. Another thing that people do within crypto is allocate to a trading trio, or at least just uh, put assets towards things in certain stages. So what is a trading trio? Of course, during bull markets, you know, everyone wants to get the flyer, right? The moon bag, that small thing that just pumps, you know, it gets users or it, it, it blows up in some way and people start using it or people start speculating it on, you know, people want to take advantage of bull markets because in bull markets, these things happen. In bear markets, of course, the opposite and these things go down. A trading trio very simply is they take risk in stages. So the layer one coin, whatever it may be, this is just an example. Again, I don't want to promote any of these coins or say that they're good or bad or anything. But you know, trading trio is you have the layer one coin, which is like broad exposure to the whole thing on top, which is where I'm comfortable. But then you have the second layer, which is DeFi apps on that on that layer, right? Which during bull markets may outperform. And we've seen that with DeFi, like if you if you look back to DeFi here, you can see at the start of the bull market, which is what we've had here, you can see that these are actually outperforming ETH, right? So if you got in here, you're actually outperforming ETH a little bit because the higher beta, as it's called, the riskier stuff may outperform in a bull market. That's why people have it. Now you can see long term, it doesn't look like they're, out, doesn't look like they're outperforming. But during bull markets, and what I'm getting at is some people want to take extra risk and have high beta in their portfolio, which means things that might outperform the layer one. Do you want to do that? Bitcoin's going to go up like 400%, Ethereum similar. Do you really want, like, do you want more than that? Like, it's a great return. But of course, people want their moon bags. So this is a way to layer those risks is to have, you know, most of it in the layer one, but then you have the ecosystem coins, right? lending, trading, whatever on that. And then you have the, the absolute casino game as the layer three, right? So the trio of trading is I've got my exposure, but my moon bags are there. And you can decide what percentage you put to that small or large, it's up to the individual. But just trying to take risk, if you really want to take risk and, and try and get this, but doing it in a way where it's, you know, you still got your lower risk exposure. I think that's the bulk of a portfolio should just be in that lower risk stuff for most people. So putting a portfolio together of these sectors, like I said, I don't just want to list coins here. It's really, it would be massively easy for me to just go and get like the top 20 most searched coins, read some of the white papers and tell you why you're going to be a millionaire by investing a thousand bucks in a couple of them. But let's just be honest about this. 
Most of these apps are going to zero. A lot of the chains are not gonna work out. We've seen, if you've been in crypto, go and look at crypto like five years ago, all of the coins are different. So there's massive risk here. In a bull market, these narratives may work, but I think we have to take a step back and say, let's have a 10 year plan or a two cycle plan, which is around eight to 10 years, to invest in really quality stuff where we can actually have some solid investments that grow really well, right? And if we wanna take the extra risk with the moon bags and stuff, we can do that, but just make sure that the bulk of what we're doing is solid, reliable stuff. Because we are not, you know, we're not at this, at, well, I am at this literally all day long, but a lot of people, you know, they have jobs that they go to, they can't spend 10 hours in front of a screen each day, they don't know exactly what's happening every single day, they can't make decisions about 15 different things and say, what, what happened to this 15th coin that I invested in? I haven't looked at it for two weeks. It is a complete nightmare. Take it with someone with experience where I managed, you know, I manage people's portfolios and investments for a living. It is a nightmare when you start getting a massive portfolio, things going in different ways, right? And so let's just simplify this and say, crypto is an asset that is just going to new all time highs over the next 10 years or so, right? It's a massive industry that's growing. Let's just get some nice exposure to it. Let's make sure that we have our, if we have our moon bags, they're not crazy amounts because a 1% allocation or a half percent allocation in something that does moon during a bull market is enough because it can go 5, 10 X. I mean, Solana's done that right at the, at the beginning of this bull market. So you don't need to over allocate to risk. You can under allocate to it because of the percentage returns that may come. But we know that 90% of this is going to zero eventually. And so we need to be in stuff that is solid, that actually makes our life better. Because we're not just in this to make great percentage returns and try and play a game. We're in it to make our lives better, make our lives simpler and have something reliable that we can say, hey, that's the bulk of my portfolio. 10 year plan, DCA into quality, dollar cost average into quality, like the layer ones that you want, Bitcoin, ETH, or whatever. DCA into those and then split your portfolio into buckets of risk so that you know if all of that risk goes to zero I've still got 80 to 90 percent of my stuff in that stuff that I'm making money on and you will make the returns in that stuff if you just wait so we don't have to rush in if you want to allocate more to risk wait for a bear market right so this is a sample and again, I don't want to say this is what you should do or anything like that. It's just a sample that we're looking at. Know where we are in the current cycle. Prices have cycles. Narratives have cycles. You can take advantage of those during the upswing, but don't get caught out in them. Don't get sold on crap because a lot of the business model for a lot of these businesses in crypto is to sell a token to us as customers. We're investors, not customers, all right? The business plan of a token could be, let's create a token for free out of nowhere that costs us nothing. Let's go online and tell people that they're gonna be rich by buying this token, because we've got a great idea. People buy the token, the token price goes up. Those people are now multimillionaires and they have a business with no users, no revenue and no future. That is why securities regulations exist in America. Because when securitization happened, there was this huge influx of people that said, wait a minute, I don't even have to have a profitable business. I can just sell people securities for a living. I can pump and dump them, right? You've all seen the Wolf of Wall Street. Well, most of crypto is that, total garbage. So we need to make sure that we are investors and not customers. We also need to make sure that we're investing in the riskier parts of crypto, that they will do well as long as the macro cycle is inflecting upwards. This is Bitcoin over time. And you can see it has a long-term uptrend. The secular uptrend of adoption in Bitcoin is up. Within that, you have price cycles that are influenced by the macro, macroeconomics. Up and down, you can see that very, very clearly. As long as you're investing in the upswing, everything's great. As soon as the downturn comes, a lot of these pink sheet garbage that's been you know, sold to people through the, the bull market goes 90%. You can take advantage of it as long as you know where we are in the cycle, but please have a long-term plan 
to just save over time as well. So put the bulk of your stuff in solid investments, DCA into them over time, don't worry too much. Make sure you're allocating during the big drawdowns in Bitcoin and Ethereum's prices, which is say Bitcoin here, right? It has drawdowns. Make sure you're allocating and saving during those. And then during the upswings, we can take more risk if we want. But remember, up here is the worst time to buy. And that's when all the narratives are popping off. You're paying the most amount of money for the most risky stuff at the top of a bull market. Do not do that. Right, that's the worst thing we can do. So if you think a narrative is going to be big, you can wait for a bear market. There's plenty of time here. So you have your stack. And then you have your risk buckets, whatever they may be in percentage terms, so that even if all that goes down, we know that the safer stuff is just going to accumulate over time. Even saying that, you know, traditional investment managers will tell you Bitcoin and Ethereum even are massively risky. You may lose all of your money in them even. So know what crypto is in terms of its risk as well versus some other things. So everyone can take that um, in the way that they want. Now, this type of thing is what I talk about in the crypto course. You know, I'm a you know, qualified investment manager, so I'm going around, how do you put a portfolio together? How do you actually use that to benefit your life? Because that's what investing is about, right? So just a lot of um, textbook stuff related to crypto, how to use crypto. Anyway, all that's for the crypto course. So if you want to get extra into that, that link is below. But that is crypto going forward in 2024, and that would be you know, a potential of portfolio and the sectors that you can allocate to.